Latin American countries have gathered together for an initiative to save the Amazon rainforests. What is the future of this move? Debates about a law in Western Australia have brought to the fore the question of how Aboriginal people and their heritage in the country are treated. What is this debate about? And nurses in Portugal recently went on strike on a variety of issues. What is at stake here? We'll be discussing all these issues in this episode of Daily Debrief. So do keep watching and don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Leaders from eight Latin American countries met to discuss one of the most important issues of our time, the future of the Amazon rainforest. The struggle to save what is called the lung of the earth has gotten a boost ever since Lula da Silva became the president of Brazil. A noteworthy part of the summit was the participation of Gustavo Petro, the president of Colombia, as well as the participation of Venezuela, which has often been excluded from such meetings. We go to Abdul for more. Abdul, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we have talked a lot on this show about uh, the Amazon forest, their you know, importance to the Latin America and in fact the entire world actually. So it's kind of encouraging to see that so many countries across the region have come together. So could you maybe give us a bit more details about, you know, the countries, what the aim of this summit was, the kind of proposals, etc.? Well, uh, significance of, of the for, uh, Amazon forest is of course well known. There is no point uh, uh, talking about, repeating uh, that fact. Uh, given that importance and given the fact that uh, since President uh, Lula came to power, he has an uh, agenda to kind of uh, uh, bring all the countries in the region which has uh, the forest cover come together and try to achieve a zero deforestation by 2030. That was the primary objective with which the, the summit was held in, uh, in Brazil. Uh, of course, that particular goal was not achieved at this moment because the countries, different countries, we should not forget that all, most of these countries in the region are also developing countries. They have aspirations uh, to kind of uh, related to the larger economic development which we, they need. And that basically has had an uh, impact on the larger objective, which, which was the center of uh, the summit of achieving zero deforestation. Nonetheless, uh, all the countries uh, agreed on certain basic points, which is, uh, of course, a move forward about uh, uh, kind of creating a common uh, research uh, uh, scientific institution, which basically will study the, uh, the, uh, the forest and uh, changing patterns of it and kind of help the countries to devise uh, their own ways to reduce deforestation and protect uh, uh, the forest. Apart from that, they also agreed uh, that they need to uh, work harder to work, kind of protect the right of the indigenous people living in and around the forest, uh, which uh, those rights have been compromised for decades, uh, uh, in fact, centuries of colonial uh, 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 interventions and uh, some policies pursued by the governments in the past, whenever the right-wing government comes to power, they basically have a tendency of kind of compromising the, uh, the right of the indigenous people living there and also kind of compromising the overall uh, 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 protection of the forest. So uh, these things where there was an agreement related to that. And of course, most of the countries agreed that they will, they agree with the idea that deforestation need to be reduced and they will pursue their individual goals uh, of course, not the common goal, but yet the individual goals to kind of reduce the deforestation. And that was the primary, uh, you can say, uh, and this is, of course, this is one of the meetings. Uh, there will be further meetings in the future. And, of course, that will help consolidate uh, the larger common agenda related to both the climate and sustainable development, which are the two key factors. Uh, yeah. Right, Abdul, also encouraging to see, on the one hand, Colombia under President Gustavo Petro, who has actually been a very strong spokesperson for some of these causes. We have heard him on multiple forums where he has strongly advocated to, uh, about the need to protect the environment, the need to protect the earth, to talk about, you know, to take concerted action. And also good to see Venezuela, which has long been excluded from these platforms from many, many of such regional gatherings. Exactly. So if you see, uh, Gustavo Petro's proposal of kind of, uh, just to kind of discuss that, 
about kind of freezing all kind of uh, oil exploration in the region uh, uh, has, of course, uh, is a well-meaning proposal. Uh, it basically talks about how this can lead to uh, uh, further deforestation and kind of destruction of the uh, rainforests altogether. And this need to be frozen. But of course, as we discussed before, the countries in the region also have their uh, basic economic needs. And uh, since uh, the forest cover a large area of their uh, uh, geographical uh, territories, they, they need to kind of uh, create a balance between the, the need, uh, between the, their economic needs and uh, the needs of the climate uh, protection. So uh, this particular uh, uh, proposal of freezing the oil exploration and all related to uh, oil industry in the region, of course, was not uh, adopted. But uh, this is one point which needs to be, and most of the countries in the region agreed to discuss it. For example, Bolivia, uh, which of course does not have, uh, given the fact that it's uh, economically, it needs the forests and the resources, but also understands the uh, need of climate uh, protection, has to kind of find a balance between it and that uh, between both the issues, and that basically creates a kind of uh, a complex situation. And uh, and therefore, they need a large, uh, strong international backing. The UN needs to back it, and all the developed countries which are basically benefiting from the Amazon forests there needs to kind of pitch in and kind of compensate these countries. So these are the issues which uh, uh, which were highlighted both uh, by all the countries participating in the uh, uh, in the meeting. And uh, they also uh, basically noted how since when uh, Lula came to power, how deforestation has radically reduced. Uh, uh, when Bolsonaro was power, uh, 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 the deforestation rates were quite high. And within a year, 60%, the rate of uh, deforestation had reduced 60%. This is a huge achievement. And this need to be built on. This kind of uh, moves needs to be strengthened. And this cannot be strengthened without the, the financial backing uh, from the developed uh, global north, which has been the beneficiary of uh, 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 the forest and its resources. So this is uh, the gist of uh, the summit. And uh, it seems that there will be future uh, deliberations, how to make it uh, much more stronger and how to kind of work together uh, for both uh, sustainable development and climate uh, uh, protection. Right, Abdul, thank you so much for talking to us and giving us an update on what is clearly a very initi important initiative, not only for Latin America, but for the entire world. Exactly. Australia's largest state is set to overturn a recent law that afforded protection to indigenous heritage sites. The Premier of the State of Western Australia announced on Tuesday that the government will be repealing the 2021 legislation. Now, this legislation was passed after countrywide outrage over the destruction of rock shelters in Jukan Gorge by the mining corporation Rio Tinto. The law gave significant say to local indigenous bodies in the management of heritage sites and it is considered important to indigenous culture and history. It was widely opposed at that time by landowners and mining corporations in the state that contributes the most to mining exports in Australia. Let's talk to Anish on this. Anish, quite a controversial development and it looks like uh, the amendment concerned, as I was saying, is connected to a significant law, there's been a lot of struggles around it. So could you maybe take us to the legal aspects first? What is being proposed? What does it seek to change, for instance? So let's begin with the law in itself, uh, the 2021 Aboriginal Heritage Law, a uh, protection law, basically uh, created a mechanism, uh, a multi-tiered mechanism, whereby local indigenous groups can be consulted uh, uh, about any kind of uh, activities like that can actually impact uh, Aboriginal heritage sites uh, across Western Australia. Now, the issue at the time, uh, at the time of when the law was passed or even proposed, uh, Indigenous groups actually talked about how they were not consulted. Uh, the law was in many ways just a reaction to what happened in the Jukan Gorge and uh, the blasting of that Indigenous site, which was about 46,000 years ago. Uh, and also the fact that uh, the law does not give them the right to Refrain, uh, refrain from giving consent, like or you know, withhold consent to any kind of construction, mining activity, or anything that will actually damage their heritage sites. It primarily gives that uh, right completely to a single minister uh, in the government. Uh, basically, the cabinet has the right eventually 
And so at the time, uh, there was that factor, but then there was also the other factor that uh, you have the settlers uh, who are uh, agriculturalists in the region who pretty much, uh, you know, contribute a large section of Australia's uh, agricultural exports. And then obviously you have the miners who uh, pretty much control most of the mining uh, uh, sector in the country and also are the ones who bankroll most of the governments in the region as well. So in both both of these uh, groups have very strongly and vehemently opposed uh, this law. And at the time, the, uh, there were like multiple campaigns and the, the result of that campaign is you have these farmers and agriculturalists saying that they are they will be held uh, for for any kind of small infraction that they might not be aware of that the law is too controversial the too contorted that it's too confusing for them to understand what can and what cannot be considered as an indigenous site and so on and so it, there were multiple myths that were being uh, produced at the time as well that also uh, added to the paranoia and frenzy so eventually what you had is that the government right now gets this cover to say that it is, uh, you know, with, withdrawing from this law uh, under public pressure because the public doesn't want, the people doesn't want it. So you do not have indigenous factors, obviously. And at the same time, you are now using a reactionary uh, pushback as a reason for uh, taking down the law and obviously adding an amendment. And we have to also have to add this amendment because it doesn't really change. It brings back the 1972 Heritage Protection Law which was uh, amended in 1979 to actually allow for the government to uh, basically destroy heritage sites uh, so that mining can continue. And we have to remember the fact that it's very, very rare for governments to actually deny any kind of uh, mining activity, especially mining activities and destruction of heritage sites uh, for mining activities. Uh, in fact, there are st statistics showing that since 2010, there has been no single project that was a request that was denied by the government for mining corporations. So you have already a very compromised system. And this law, like this law at some level gave some advisory powers to the local groups. And even that has been taken back even before it actually got to be implemented on the ground. Right, Anish, also in this context, there's some debate about what is being called the indigenous voice, some kind of an institutionalization. But I understand it, even that is controversial. Why is that so? Well, the indigenous voice in general, uh, like uh, the larger campaign is basically a constitutional amendment that is being pushed. Uh, and the amendment will seek to a recognize the fact that uh, indigenous aboriginals are actually uh, the original inhabitants of the land and they obviously have a uh, primary uh, uh, authority when it comes to matters that deals with them, their communities and their lands, their title, uh, the native title, as we say, in uh, uh, North America, but pretty much similar, like Aboriginal lands and obviously heritage sites. So it's a very wider constitutional recognition of indigenous rights and the standing as you know the actual indigenous group and the original inhabitants of the continent. Uh, so there is definitely controversy uh, on one hand in the fact that obviously this again does not give very similar to the Western Australian law does not give them the power to withhold consent or prevent any kind of projects that they might be or any kind of legislation that they might be to be uh, not in their favor or not uh, in their interest. Uh, and so there are indigenous groups who have criticized that. But on the wider scale, the fact that it will include a constitutional recognition of the fact that there are original inhabitants and not the, uh, and pretty much, uh, you know, undermining this whole nullius terra kind of, uh, sorry, terra nullius kind of uh, attitude that the government's constitutional system had about Australia where they assumed that there were no humans living uh, in Australia before the colonizers came. So that is something that is uh, supported widely by the indigenous groups in general. You have progressive movements across uh, different uh, ideological lines. You have labor, greens, and obviously the communists uh, supporting it. And uh, at the same time, uh, so there is this sort of uh, campaign being happening and you see the referendum closing in uh, there has been a ma massive reactionary pushback, but the labor in, at the federal level has not backed down their support for this new amendment. 
But at the same time, you have the Labour government in Western Australia backing down from a very small, uh, it might not be that much, but a small and significant progress that did happen in Western Australia that was instituted by them when it comes, even in its limited scale of just preventing mining activities in heritage sites, uh, is being back and they're backing out because of the reactionary pushback. So you have in both cases a contradiction, and at the same time you have at some level there might be some uh, you know uh, backfiring because it might actually give reactionaries emboldened them with the fact that they can definitely overturn uh, legislation that they might not see to be in their favor in the future. So even if the amendment and the fact that the amendment is not getting that much traction in public opinion, uh, primarily because the government is not actually, uh, you know, using its resources to campaign very strongly for it, while the reactionaries and corporations have actually supported, uh, you know, uh, in uh, massively financing of the no vote. Uh, creates the situation where you have this being used by reactionaries as, uh, you know, a linchpin to say that this is exactly what they want to do. They want to pretty much prevent us from our development. So you have a very complicated situation, obviously, uh, but we need to see how that this is going to impact it in the final vote, because obviously there are a couple of months left to go before the vote actually does happen. Right, Anish, thank you so much for that update. And finally, at the end of July, nurses working in private hospitals in Portugal held a strike to raise awareness about the problems they face at work. Among the reasons behind the strike were low salaries and longer work schedules when compared to their counterparts in public hospitals. We have with us Anna Vrachar of the People's Health Movement with more details. Anna, thank you so much for joining us. Of course, on this show, we have time and again covered protests by health workers across the world. And it's in some ways interesting and also depressing maybe that Many of the issues are almost exactly the same. So now we're talking about nurses in Portugal. So could you tell us what was the reason for uh, the pro nurses going on strike? Well, you know, um, it's uh, it's actually uh, one of the many strike actions that uh, they organized at the end of July. Uh, in the um, this time, in particular, among the nurses working for the private health sector in Portugal. So, you know, if if we look a bit back, uh, we know that from November 2022, uh, there have been on and off strikes both in both public and private sectors um, because of uh, multiple multiple reasons. So, you know, uh, of course, we have the issue of uh, staff shortages, which is quite uh, quite common right now um, uh, in Europe. But of course, there are also the issues related to, to salary increases, which are not coming, uh, but also to the long working hours and so on and so on. So the most right. recent uh, example that we have seen in Portugal, sorry, uh, so it's um, um, at the end of July, uh, was organized by the, by the nurses in the private sector who said that, you know, uh, the the way that their work was organized uh, was lagging behind, even behind that of the public sector, which is not great to begin with. So they were saying, and they st still are saying that the private sector is not actually keeping up with the pace, with the salaries in the public sector. So uh, may, uh, they're not paying all the additional uh, working hours that the nurses are putting in. Uh, they have longer working schedules uh, compared to the public sector. In the private sector, you have to work uh, so the starting point is 40 hours a week uh, for, uh, for for nurses in the public sector. Formally, the, the starting point would be 35 hours. Uh, so it's this kind of um, inconsistencies between the two systems uh, that uh, that the nurses were protesting against. And it's important to uh, to say here that, uh, you know, it's um, for for quite a bit of time, the private sector in Portugal was uh, seen as something quite um marginal let's put it that way it was not so big but then uh, in the last in the past 10 years um health activists on the ground have warned that it has uh it has grown uh very very uh like insistently and um continuously so right now they're estimating that about 15000 nurses in portugal are working full time for the uh, in the private sector so this is not something that uh, that relates only to a very small group of nurses Absolutely. An interesting point, Anna, because often you hear that people leave the public sector to go to private sector jobs. But what it seems is that private sector jobs are, in some senses, maybe even more underpaid 
which is which seems to be the case in Portugal. But can you maybe take us through also the larger context of the health system there itself, and for that matter, in many European countries, which is leading to such a crisis? Uh, yes, so uh, you know, I think that here also we've talked uh, multiple times about uh, the the austerity and the budget cuts that have actually shaped health systems in Europe for the for the past decades. Uh, and this is not very different what, from what we are seeing in Portugal. Uh, you know, again, uh, it's interesting to point out here that uh, when it comes to nurses in Portugal, they have been quite uh, vocal about supporting other nurses' uh, struggles in other uh, countries in Europe. For example, when the nurses in the UK first went on strike last, uh, last winter in uh, 2022, uh, Portuguese nurses stood behind them and uh, actually supported them in, in their requests. Uh, and what uh, they're pointing out in Portugal right now uh, is something that, again, we're seeing in many countries in Europe right now. Uh, it's a lack of recognition for nurses' work. So, you know, we had that moment during the COVID-19, the early COVID-19 pandemic, when nurses, along with doctors, were hailed as heroes, as someone uh, whose uh, work uh, actually uh, kept people alive. Uh, but then as we move uh, move away from that, we see that, you know, nurses are still in a subordinate position compared to physicians in particular. Uh, their rights are not so well articulated in health policies when they're made. And what the nurses in Portugal now are saying is that uh, that's also because nurses are not part of the conversation. So nobody's actually asking the nurses what they need, what they uh, what they want to see, uh, what they think would be the best thing to happen for the patients. and. Um, so uh, instead, it's all about the money. It's always about the lack of uh, management. It's always about the right of doctors. Uh, and uh, what um, seems to be the case in Portugal right now is that there is a group of nurses who is trying to change that uh, and to actually uh, try and organize and make sure that uh, the nursing associations, the nursing uh, nurses organizations in, in general uh, are more responsive to what nurses tell them and then able also to bring it back to the government and back to the employers. Right. Thank you so much, Anna, for that explanation. I think uh, also analyzing some of the larger patterns that are affecting the health, se the health, care, health sector across Europe. You talked about how there is a shortage of employees, how they are bringing uh, you know, uh, health workers from parts of Africa, which are already understaffed. And in many ways, these actually, these two issues connect very well together and a lot of issues to be addressed in the future for these countries as well. Thank you so much. And that's all we have in today's episode of Daily Debrief. Do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org, our YouTube channel, so that you can watch more such episodes, more videos from around the world. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Thank you.